There are, are six different buttons at the bottom. Uh, those are really your controls for this meeting. Uh, on the far left is a microphone. That is your mute and unmute button. Um, that is where you should be doing all of your muting and unmuting, not on a phone or otherwise. It's all through the computer. Um, the other two buttons I want to draw your attention to is the open participants list, um, as well as the chat function. The participants list will give you um, a list of everybody's in the meeting, but will also give you the opportunity to raise your hand if you have any questions during the course of the meeting. And finally, the um, there's a chat function for you to um, be able to indicate to staff if you're having any technical difficulties. Uh, this is not a um, for any uh, public discussion. Everything uh, for commission business will be conducted over this meeting. I do believe that we have now gone live, so I am going to step away. Um, and uh, Madam Chair, are you ready to get started, or would you like us to um, take a moment um, before we get going? Yes. I'm ready, Ms. Matthijs, as long as you can hear me. We can. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, um, my fellow commissioners and staff and those who may be watching on the live stream. Um, this is Katie Crystal speaking. I'm the chair of the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission. Um, we are beginning the meeting. How about that? It's 6.59 by my count. <laughs> So um, I'll begin with, uh, here we go. The clock has struck seven. We're beginning the meeting at seven o'clock for the record. So um, given the ongoing public health emergency related to the novel coronavirus and the governor's ban on gatherings of people 10 or more, we are conducting this meeting electronically. We are able to do so because of a law passed by the General Assembly on April 22nd and soon thereafter signed into law by Governor Northam as a legislative amendment to the budget bill. It allows us as a public body um, to meet electronically without a physical quorum present to discuss or transact the business that is statutorily required of or necessary to continue our operations. Um, moment to say thank you very much uh, uh, to the members of the General Assembly and the Governor for acting to allow this. Um, so uh, thank you to our staff, which has provided, followed all of the procedures and guidelines that were included um, in that expansion of virtual meeting authorities um, to give notice to all of the commissioners, staff, and public. Um, and we have asked everyone to call in, which you have, using an audio teleconferencing platform while the meeting is simultaneously being broadcast to the public on YouTube. Um, a note to my fellow commissioners about trying to help this meeting run as smoothly as possible in this unusual format. Um, everyone has been provided an agenda uh, with detailed scripts um, uh, and stage directions, if you will. Um, it provides all the information on the logistics of participating in the meeting and the order for the roll call vote. That last piece is particularly important, that order. If you can follow that agenda, it's going to help make sure that you're ready to unmute when it's your turn to vote, um, and it will help it keep us moving effectively. Um, so, uh, a couple other pieces. Um, again, we've asked that you join via your computer for um, video and your phone for audio. A little unconventional, um, but what that is doing is reducing feedback and allowing for the optimal live streaming to the public. So, um, I think Ms. Matice has gone over that with any commissioners that had questions, but thank you for bearing with that two-step process. Um, uh, important to note, the, the microphone icon on your computer that Kate was describing for us is all that you need to click to unmute. You don't need to mute and unmute your phone. Um, you can just mute and unmute from the screen um, to be muted or unmuted accordingly. Um, uh, again, uh, Kate ran, ran over this, but I'm going to take another quick second and do so for anyone joining us late. Um, we are going to rely on the raise hand icon, um, which you can navigate over to um, by clicking participants. Um, scrolling down until you see yourself, uh, which actually may appear first, um, and clicking that raise hand icon. Um, Alan Fry, Alan, excuse me, Alan Fry, thank you, Alan, will be monitoring the hand raising. Um, if you're not able to see the raise hand function, there are instructions for you provided in your scripted agenda materials um, that can help you do that. Um, this is going to be really critical to, to help us make sure that everybody who'd like to speak on a given issue can speak without having to go through 17 people round robin every time on every issue. So thank you for bearing with that. Um, and again, there are instructions on how to do that uh, in your meeting script. Um, there are a few presentations that will be happening tonight. Uh, the only visual components of this meeting is those presentation slides. We have no video of commissioners. Um, so you'll see those slides on your WebEx platform and they're also going to appear on the YouTube live stream. Live stream. Um, we're asking uh, whomever is presenting, uh, be that staff or anyone else, to introduce themselves as they speak. Um, generally, we're maybe a little more participatory. I can read the room and see who'd like to jump in at different points in presentation. 
Uh, in this case, I'm going to have to ask that we each hold our questions and comments until the end of the presentation. Um, and again, we're going to ask you to raise hands. Um, our staff will monitor and let me know who's who has indicated an interest in speaking. Um, again, please do use that mute, that round red button on your computer screen, not your phone, to mute and unmute. And of course, as a standard virtual meeting etiquette, um, please do mute when you're not speaking to reduce any background noise. Uh, great example. <laughs> so, um, we have a couple of, of action items tonight that are going to require a vote. Um, and so when I come to your vote, I'm going to, I'm going to ask the maker and seconder of the motion to identify themselves. And then Rhonda Gilchrist is going to conduct a roll call vote for each action being requested. That is the time that we will do a round robin. Um, again, you can see your meeting script to know the order in which you'll be called on um, to cast your vote. Uh, if a commissioner does not respond when it's their time or at the end, um, they'll be noted as not present. Um, and then the final thing to just emphasize again, um, as Kate was talking about, there is a chat function, which is perhaps a helpful way to get your technical questions answered. If you're, for example, having a hard time finding the raise hand function or have questions about muting or unmuting. But it's really important that we don't conduct any business in that chat box. Um, so, so please do reserve that for technical questions. If you have a question about the content being presented, a point of view to raise, uh, motions and so forth, please do use that raise hand function. So we're going to give this a try with the muting and unmuting and calling the roll. Um, Ms. Gilchrist, uh, if you could call the roll to identify the commissioners for purposes of quorum, um, I am going to turn things over to you. Thank you. Um, please respond here or present when you hear your name. Chair Crystal. Here. Mr. Alcorn. Mr. Gary. Here. Ms. Bennett Parker. Here. Mr. Dave Brenty. Here. Mr. Evan. I know he's, well, okay. Mr. Faust. Here. Ms. Garvey. Mr. Letourneau. Mr. McKay. Here. Mr. Meyer. Here. Ms. Palchuk. Here. Mr. Smedberg. Present. Mr. Snyder. Mr. Turner. Here. Mr. Turner's here. Mr. Turner. Mr. Walkinshaw. Here. Ms. Mitchell is an alternate. Here. Mr. Storkin is an alternate. Let's quickly go back. Did, is Ms., did Mr. Elkhorn join? Or Ms. Garvey? We have quorum. Now I'm going to identify the rest of the staff participating in the call and include their titles for the benefit of the listening public. Executive Director Kate Matais, NVTC Board Secretary Rhonda Gilchrist, Director of Finance and Administration Scott Kalkor, Director of Programs and Policy Alan Fry, WMATA Program Manager Andrew DeVetter, Program Analyst Matt Chang, NVTC Legal Counsel Steve McIsaac, MBTC Legislative Liaison Amy Farron Siebert, Acting BRE Chief Executive Officer Rich Dalton, WMATA's Virginia Government Relations Officer Greg Potts. I now turn it back over to the Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Gilchrist. Um, well done all. <laughs> so um, let me uh, begin with that uh, somewhat lengthy preamble. I actually have a few comments about um, the substance of our agenda tonight. Um, I want to just take a quick second to again thank um, Ms. Gilchrist and, and certainly the rest of the NPT staff who have been working um, feverishly behind the scenes to make this meeting a success. I, I know that this has been a, a tremendous lift um, to, to make this meeting possible in the days since um, that legislative change was passed on the 22nd. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to NBTC's Manager of IT and Web Resources, Melissa Walker, who has taken care of every small detail to ensure that we can have a successful launch of this way of meeting. Melissa, thank you so much. 
Um, I trust that everybody's had a chance to review the agenda. We have one additional action item related to electronic participation. Uh, under normal circumstances, we'd call that a blue sheet, but uh, virtually, I suppose everything's the same color on your laptop. Um, so that additional action is again related to electronic participation. It's added to agenda item number three. Um, this is belt and suspenders. It's a resolution to provide justification for NVTC to hold this particular business meeting. Um, really uh, uh, making sure we're emphatic that, that we are taking advantage of that new legislative authority or legislatively granted authority um, for the purposes for which it's intended. So I'm gonna ask for approval of that resolution as a first action item for the meeting. Um, a few other action items that we have, uh, a revised electronic participation policy, um, an endorsement of Fairfax's application to uh, the US DOT's BUILD grant program, that's regarding the Richmond Highway Bus Rapid Transit Project, and the authorization to notify the CTB of a change in selection timeline for our commuter choice round four program of projects. Um, the, we will, of course, also have uh, a, a, a fulsome report from our WMATA board members, WMATA committee members, and an opportunity to discuss um, various issues related to WMATA operations, the upcoming shutdown, uh, our new 3% cap study group, um, uh, and distribution of um, federal relief funds. Um, so quite a few information items as well as those action items. Um, first, a, a, a happy announcement. Um, I'm going to move into the oath of office for our new commissioner. Um, I'm so glad to share that on April 28th, my colleague, Arlington County Board Member Arlington, Ar Arlington County Board Member Matt DeFranti, um was appointed to NBTC. Uh, he was officially sworn in as a commissioner by Rhonda earlier this week. But as, as is our custom, we'd like to administer a ceremonial oath of office to welcome him as a new commissioner to NVTC. Um, again, this is the type of thing I think we're generally doing in person, um, but uh, Mr. DeFranti, I trust that you are raising your right hand uh, if you would prepare to unmute and repeat the following after me. Sure. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Commonwealth of Virginia. I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Commonwealth of Virginia. And that I will faithfully discharge all the duties incumbent upon me. And that I will faithfully discharge all of the duties incumbent upon me. As a member of the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, according to the best of my ability. As a member of the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission, according to the best of my abilities. Welcome to the commission, Mr. DeFranti. We're delighted to have you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Moving on, as I mentioned, we have two actions related to the electronic participation. Uh, so we're going to take them up in the order. Uh, the first is resolution number 2409, finding a need to conduct this meeting May 7th, 2020 electronically. Again, it's included as a blue sheet item on the NBTC website. Um, Kate, can you give us just a, a, a word or two about this resolution in specific? Absolutely. Um, so indeed, as you said um, in the preamble, this is a resolution that is specific about this meeting. Um, and it is um, basically making it very clear to the commission uh, that the commission has the appropriateness of holding this meeting electronically, uh, specifically related to the fact that this is a declared emergency that makes it uh, impractical and unsafe for us to meet in a single location. Um, and also that the um, items that are being discussed are uh, related to our continuity of operations or they're statutorily required. Um, and they very much uh, support uh, the laws and duties and responsibilities of this organization. And furthermore, uh, that what we are doing here um, include items that are encompassed within a number of the continuity of operations ordinances that have been adopted by many of the localities that are members of NDTC. So again, this is a resolution for this evening. If we as a commission need to hold another a remote electronic meeting uh, during this, during this um, emergency, we would do another resolution specifically for that as well. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Matice. Um, I'm gonna open it up for any comments or questions. I think this one is relatively straightforward. Um, personally, I'm pleased to support it, um, but I, we are gonna try our first go at the um, raising hand function. Um, so if you all have any questions or comments or um, if there are none and you'd like to make a motion, please use that raise your hand feature right now. I mean, I clicked on the button, but I don't know if uh, they saw it. <laughs> Alan, what do you think? Yes, uh, Kata, go ahead. Thank you. 
Great. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to move approval of the resolution. Thank you so much. Do we have a second? Second. And was that Mr. DeFranti? Yes, it was. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so moved by Mr. Aguirre, seconded by uh, Mr. DeFranti. Uh, Mr. Fire, are there any questions popping up with the raise hand? Checking that. No questions at the moment, Madam Chair. Okay, great. So, uh, hearing no further questions or discussion, I'm going to ask our clerk, our senior secretary, to again call the roll for a vote. Chair Crystal. Yes. Mr. Alcorn. Recorded as not present. Mr. Gary. Aye. Ms. Bennett Parker. Aye. Mr. Dave Parenti. Aye. Mr. Eben. Mr. Faust. Aye. Ms. Garvey. Mr. Letourneau. Aye. Mr. McKay. Mr. Meyer. Aye. Ms. Palchek. Aye. Mr. Smedberg. Aye. Mr. Snyder. Mr. Turner. Aye. Mr. Walkinshaw. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary. All right, great work, everyone. That passes. Um, all right, our um, next order of business um, is similarly related to electronic participation, but um, in the name of not letting a crisis go to waste, this is an opportunity to actually move forward not only our electronic participation policy regarding um, emergency meetings such as the one we're having, but also to um, uh, adopt some revisions to uh, our electronic participation policy that were under consideration anyway by staff. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Matthijs to talk a little bit more um, about what is included in those revisions to the original 2014 policy that are before us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. So indeed, NGTC was actually already, we were in the process uh, at the staff level of updating this policy once we had all of the renovations done to our conference center, which allow for telephone par uh, participation. Um, so this is something we had in the works, but obviously uh, we we're able to bring this at a very timely uh, point. Um, so what we have uh, in front of you is an updated policy uh, that um, outlines and brings up to date um, all of the things in the Virginia Code related to the Freedom of Information Act, uh, because that does permit uh, members of a public body such as NVTC to participate in meetings through electronic means. Um, and so what the policy does, it just outlines the various procedures um, and provisions of which would allow that. And so just a couple of the highlights on that um, is that um, it would allow our commissioners to participate electronically um, in, a, in up to two meetings per year um, for a number of different reasons. For example, um, if they are unable to make a meeting uh, due to uh, some uh, either a health or otherwise issue that keeps them away. Um, it also allows them um, if your principal residence is more than 60 miles from the meeting location. Um, and also, um, hang on a sec, sorry about that, I just missed what I was looking at. But, uh, but the idea being is that in certain circumstances would allow uh, for commissioners to uh, participate electronically. The most important thing about the policy in general is that we would need to have a physical forum um, to conduct any of the meetings. So this is a little bit different than we're talking about now with an emergency declaration, uh, but this just is in routine business. Um, and so again, we must have a physical uh, quorum present. Um, it is limited to two meetings of the public body per member uh, per calendar year. Um, and then of course, uh, we will always make sure uh, that uh, there is full uh, participation access 
um, and in ability to hear those who are participating remotely um, and having this available for the public. Um, so again, this is updating, refreshing, and allowing electronic participation uh, for all of our committee meetings and the full commission meeting, mostly because we now have the technology to do so. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Matai, so much. Um, I am going to, again, turn the floor open for questions, comments, or emotions. Please signal your intent to ask a question or make a motion by raising your hand. Mr. Fai, do we have anybody stepping up? Yes, um, again, uh, Mr. McGarry. Mr. Vice Madam Chair. Chair I, I, Madam Chair, I'd like to move uh, approval of the revised electronic participation policy. Thank you. Do we have a second? Palchik, second. Thank you very much, Commissioner Palchik. All right, that's been moved and seconded. Are we having seeing any other hands coming over the transom with questions? Okay. Not yet. No, no, no questions. Right. Great. Seeing none, um, that's been moved by Mr. Aguirre, seconded by Ms. Palchik. Um, the secretary will call the roll for a vote. Mr. Crystal. Yes. Mr. Elkhorn. Mr. Gary. Aye. Mr. Gary. Aye. Ms. Bennett Parker. Aye. Mr. Dave Parenti. Aye. Mr. Evan. Mr. Faust. Aye. Ms. Garvey? Mr. Letourneau? Aye. Mr. McKay? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Ms. Palchik? Aye. Mr. Smedberg? Aye. Mr. Schneider? Aye. Mr. Turner? Aye. Mr. Walkinshaw? Aye. The motion passes, and I'll turn it back to the chair. Thanks very much, Madam Secretary. Um, all right, another action item um, is the minutes of our March 5th meeting when we were last physically assembled together. Um, I hope everyone's had the opportunity to review those. Um, so uh, I'm gonna turn again to Alan for whether there are any hands up um, and encourage someone to raise hands in the chat box if they either have a question um, or amendment to those minutes or if they're ready to uh, make a motion to adopt them. All right, then by Madam Chair, we're having a little bit of a lag with the um, of coming through. Okay, no problem. No questions? Madam Chair, I'd move uh, approval of the min meeting minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice Chair. Second, this is Mr. DeFranti. Thank you very much, Mr. DeFranti. Okay, those motions have been um, moved and seconded. Uh, I'm gonna turn again to our secretary to call the roll. Uh, yay, nay, or of course you're free to abstain if you were not present for the meeting. Um, all right, Madam Secretary. Chair Crystal. Aye. Mr. Elkhorn. Mr. Gary. Aye. Ms. Bennett Parker. Abstain. Mr. Dave Parenti. Abstain. Mr. Evan. Abstain. Mr. Faust. Aye. Ms. Garvey. Mr. Letourneau. Abstain. Mr. McKay. Aye. Mr. Meyer. Aye. Patrick. Aye. Mr. Smedberg. Aye. Mr. Snyder. Aye. 
Mr. Turner. Aye. Mr. Walkenshaw. Aye. The motion passes. I turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Good news, folks. Just two more of these round robins to go. Um, the first is regarding our consent agenda. We have just one item, and that is reendorsing um, Fairfax County's Route 1 BRT application to this year's Federal Build Act program. Um, so there is on our consent agenda a, a letter of support for Fairfax County um, that uh, if this is a successful action, I will um, add my signature to on behalf of the commission. So is there a motion uh, to approve that item and with it the total of the consent agenda? Um, okay. uh, Madam Chair, I would second. I, um, Right. Does someone want to try one more time? Oh, that was so a move McKay, approval Adam by Evan. McKay moved Senator approval. Evan. Evan second. Okay, McKay not McKay moved. Uh, Evan seconded. Um, any questions? Okay, seeing none. No questions. Um, oh, please, there are questions. Oh. No, no questions, Madam Chair. No questions. Thanks, Mr. Vice. Um, okay, so I'm going to turn again to our secretary for a roll call vote. Chair Crystal. Aye. Mr. Alcorn. Mr. Gary. Aye. Ms. Bennett Parker. Aye. Mr. Dave Parenti. Aye. Mr. Evan. Aye. Mr. Faust. All right. Ms. Garvey. Mr. Letourneau. Aye. Aye. Mr. McKay. Aye. Mr. Meyer. Aye. Aye. Ms. Kelchick. Aye. Mr. Smedberg. Aye. Mr. Snyder. Aye. Mr. Turner. Aye. Mr. Walkinshaw. Aye. The motion passes. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you again. Okay, so um, our probably our most substantive bit of business here requiring a vote tonight um, is item number six, which is, a, which is a commuter choice program. Um, there is an action before us to authorize the executive director to notify the CTB, the Commonwealth Tran Transportation Board, um, of a change in our selection timeline for the I-66 commuter choice round four program of projects. Um, that is different than what we had anticipated. We had anticipated at the time, I believe, um, voting on recommended projects to send to the CTB. Um, quite obviously, circumstances have changed, um, particularly regarding the 66 toll revenues. So I'm gonna turn things back over to Ms. Matisse to speak a little bit to the action requested um, and what staff is proposing here um, with the change in selection timeline. Thank you, Madam Chair. So yeah, indeed, um, we were gonna be uh, talking about uh, the various projects for consideration and sharing those with the CTB this month, uh, but obviously things have changed a little bit. So let me just give a little bit of background. Uh, this round four for commuter choice for the I-66 inside the Beltway program, we had received a total of 14 applications for eligible projects requesting about $33.7 million for this two-year program. And so prior to the COVID-19 emergency, uh, we had anticipated a total of 25 million available in toll revenues to fund this two-year program. And it was our intent for the May meeting to actually hold a public hearing this evening um, and then also then ask for authorization to present to the CTB uh, the projects that this, this body would consider for funding under the program. And we're now asking for authorization to notify CTB uh, that we want to move that time frame a little bit later. And the reason why is uh, just a little bit earlier in April, we were notified by D VDOT uh, that the toll revenue collections from I-66 inside the Beltway were already down sharply, even just comparing March 2019 to March 2020. And this is, of course, directly due to the reduced traffic um, as a result of this public health emergency. And so this reduction in known revenues, and then of course the uncertainty as to when revenues will rebound makes it challenging to predict the availability of I-66 inside Beltway toll revenues for this next round of uh, project selection. And as such, the staff is recommending that we move the selection and approval process uh, for round four until later this calendar year, 
when we have, we'll have a better sense of the amounts available for revenues for this program, and we have basically uh, increasing our predictability of what revenues would be available. Um, I think it's really important to note, though, um, we do have existing projects under the I-66 Commuter Choice um, Funding Program that we've already funded for this year. Um, and so, uh, but VDOT notified us that the net available toll revenue payments um, for our current projects, we're actually already going to be down close to $7 million below what was approved in the budget. We are in a very, very fortunate situation, though, um, and staff have been working very carefully to identify carryover balances, accrued interest, and what have you, um, and we are confident that we will be able to meet the commitments of the current projects uh, that are obligated under this program. So upon approval of the commission to delay the selection process, uh, NVTC staff will be notifying all of our applicants, as well as VDOT and DRPT of this action. We will also suspend the public comment period. We actually had it open. We've been collecting comments, uh, but we will be suspending that um, and reopening it later this summer to coincide with the development and selection of the round four program of projects. Uh, we do plan on reconvening the program advisory committee, meet, committee, I should say, a little bit later this summer so we can discuss the overall impact and any other policy considerations that we need to at that time. Um, and then again, in the fall, staff would return to the commission for approval of a program of projects and subsequently submit it to the CTV for approval. And so I'm happy to turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Ms. Mateis. Um, a note too, if you all could begin raising hands to uh, ask any questions you may have either about this action before us, but also the, the changes in the 66 revenue. I think that's something we all probably assumed was happening because there are more questions um, about its impact on the fiscal 2020 program of projects, which Kate just summarized. Um, now would be a great time to ask those as well. Um, uh, a quick programming mo moving forward. I think I'm going to ask everyone to, to start raising their hands to ask questions during the presentation. I think that'll be uh, even more meaningful or, or relevant during our WMATA presentation, um, DRPG presentations and others. Uh, but I think that could, could help us move straight into questions instead of this lag. Um, now that I have hopefully filled this, that lag with this programming announcement, <laughs> Alan, are there any questions or raised hands for this item? Perfect. Thank you, Chair Crystal. We have one question from uh, Ms. Bennett Parker. Thank you. Um, would this uh, change impact the timing of the I-395 commuter choice program? That's a great so, question. Madam Chair, yeah. yeah. So this is Kate Matice, and um, at this time we do not anticipate any changes. Uh, we were already planning to start the call for projects a little bit later this year for the 395 program. At this time, we do not anticipate any changes. Obviously, the overall impact of revenues and the, and the toll programs of both of those facilities are things we're watching very closely. But at this time, we do plan on proceeding with 395 under the already planned schedule of opening things up in the fall for selection next spring, a year from now. And Kate, at that time, we'll have, of course, a better prediction of what types of toll revenues are likely to come in on 395 corridor based on this new reality, right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, any other have questions? Any other now? questions? Nope, not at the moment, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, could I look then for someone to make a motion? Sure, Chair Crystal, this is Mr. DeFranti. I move that we authorize the Executive Director to notify the Commonwealth Transportation Board of a change in the selection timing for the I-66 Commuter Tour Round 4 program projects. Thank you. Second, Mr. Uh, seconded by, I'm sorry, who? Kanek. Oh, great. Thank you both very much. All right. That's been moved and seconded. Alan, do we have any more questions popping up? Uh, no, unless Mr. Gary had any questions. You had your hand up. No, I was just raising my hand to uh, the second. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. No, no other questions, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, uh, seeing none, that's been moved and seconded. I think we'll turn it back to the Secretary for, again, our final action item. The final time we'll meet her to call roll. Um, so please, Ms. Gilchrist. Chair Crystal. Oh, Madam Chair. Oh, Madam Chair. Was that Mr. Question. Schneider with a question? Yep. I want to make sure, does this in any way um, 
will this be viewed as in any way jeopardizing the sums that that we would expect considering the changes in the tolls? In other words, is there any downside to taking this action tonight? I just wanted that on the record. Madam Chair, uh, for, no, that I could, I'm even, happy. Could you confirm? Yeah. So, indeed, um, obviously, we're working very closely with the Commonwealth. Um, it is our understanding they may even have a delay in the uh, release of their own six year improvement program. So, at this time, we do not anticipate that this will be uh, changing what we're able to do. Um, the first year funding, uh, which is what we would be looking at, is your fiscal year 20 revenue funding. That's what we're going to be watching very closely. So, we'll have a better sense in the fall. But we do plan on moving forward with the program um, and just having it a better aligned with an understanding of how many revenue, how much revenue is available. Thank you. Great, thanks, Mr. Snyder. Okay, um, so unless there are any other questions, and please don't be shy. If we're if I'm moving too quickly and you don't get your question in, of course, take your time and uh, to, to unmute. Thanks, Mr. Snyder, for modeling that. Um, so if there are no more questions, uh, please, Madam Secretary, could you call the roll? Chair Crystal. Aye. Mr. Elkhorn. Mr. Gary. Aye. Ms. Bennett Parker. Aye. Mr. Dave Ferenti. Aye. Mr. Mr. Evan. Aye. Mr. Faust. Aye. Aye. Ms. Darby. Mr. Letourneau. Mr. Letourneau? Aye. Okay. Mr. McKay? Aye. Mr. Meyer? Aye. Belchek? Aye. Mr. Smedberg? Aye. Mr. Snyder? Aye. Mr. Turner? Aye. Mr. Walkinshaw? Aye. The motion passes. Thank you so much, Ms. Gilchrist. Okay. Um, we'll move. Oh, and I think we may have a bit of an echo, so I may ask everyone if you wouldn't mind just muting yourselves again. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we'll move next into our WMATA report. Um, beginning, uh, this will follow in a couple of sections. We're going to begin with um, the WMATA COVID-19 response. Um, talk a little bit about as well uh, the federal CARES Act. I'm sorry, could I again ask everybody to mute? Thanks. Um, uh, because, uh, excuse me, after the, um, the CARES response, we'll talk a little bit about the new NBCC working group on the impact of the 3% operating subsidy cap. Um, and then we'll pause for questions. Um, uh, we will then give an opportunity for a report from the chair from the NVTC WMATA committee, a report from the WMATA board members, and we'll pause for questions again. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll coach everyone along the way. Please don't feel like you need to be um, too tied to the topic at hand. If you have other WMATA questions, um, please do feel free to raise a hand. Uh, and uh, if we need to redirect you to a later point in the program, we can definitely do that. So again, um, please do feel free to start raising your hand as the speakers are presenting. Um, so that we don't have to pause at the end. Thank you all for, again, for bearing with us. So, um, the first item, again, of WMATA business um, is the WMATA COVID-19 response, um, which was a major topic of the WMATA committee last Thursday. Um, so, I'm going to turn to our two WMATA board members, Paul and Matt, to give a brief update on current activities at WMATA, um, and then if you could talk a bit about the leveraging of the federal funding relief, federal relief funding, rather, that has been made available. Uh, under CARES for transit operators. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Paul and Matt in whichever order you two might like to go. Thank you, uh, Chair Crystal. Uh, this is Paul Smedberg. Um, approximately two weeks ago, uh, the WMATA board approved a resolution in response to the Federal CARES Act, which allocated $1.02 billion to the D.C. area or FTA direct recipients. Only direct recipients are responsible for meeting FTA reporting requirements and submitting reimbursements 
uh, as part of this action, the WMATA board also approved the availability of an operating subsidy credit to local transit providers who are not federal funding recipients. This obviously uh, created quite a bit of uh, debate and discussion. Um, and to that end, I'd like to uh, actually turn it over to the executive director, Kate Matice. Uh, to put some uh, fine points on this and further explain what what this means to uh, you know the member jurisdictions. Kate, thank you, Mr. Smedberg. Um, indeed, uh, WMATA is uh, providing a credit to the operating subsidy to our local uh, NBTC jurisdictions uh, as a part of their next quarterly billing statement, which in this case uh, will be the statement for the first quarter of fiscal year 2021, uh, that would, it starts July 1st. And so what WMATA did is they, they calculated these credits uh, according to a methodology that mirrors uh, the way the Federal Transit Administration also allocates this type of formula funding to the DC area. So this is all based upon data that's submitted to the National Transit Database and then other, uh, other factors like population density. What's going to happen is these credits that WMATA is providing to localities are allowing them to use these savings to support their own local transit systems, capital, operating, and other expenses that they've already incurred um, or anticipate to incur as a response to COVID-19. Um, in addition, our local jurisdictions can use these credits to cover their loss of their own revenues uh, that they would have otherwise used to fund their WMATA um, operating subsidy payment. Um, and so this is something that uh, we've worked very, very closely with the jurisdictional staff and with WMATA staff. And this is something that all of the jurisdictions will see um, in their next quarterly billing statement from WMATA. Um, and one thing I did want to point out, while it's not required, um, just insofar for information, um, it's encouraged that the uh, NBTC jurisdictions share with us, with the staff, you know, if they have any board resolutions or budget items. Uh, that resulted um, from the credit that was provided by WMATA, whether they were supporting specific transit activities in their own jurisdictions or what have you, that will just be very helpful for us uh, in terms of tracking um, how well these credits uh, were used. And so that is what I have, and I'm happy to turn it back uh, to the chair. Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, please, yeah, and Mr. Smedberg, I'll leave it in your capable hands. Please. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I just want to say before you turn it over to, to Matt, um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Ms. Matice's work on our behalf as it relates specifically to this issue. It was extremely helpful, you know, Kate having uh, executive experience coming from FTA uh, and now obviously at MBTC, uh, being, um, being able to understand this process, being able to, to work with the jurisdictional staff and others to, to work through this process. It was it was really, really helpful for her to be part of this, and, and she really helped guide uh, us, uh, you know, through this. So it was, it was very helpful, and just wanted to acknowledge that uh, before the group. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Mr. Sundberg. Yeah, that's a great point. I think this is a, a certainly a positive outcome. I, I think I've, I've been generally of the impression, talking to you and, and to Kate both, that this is not something that. WMATA had to do, and so I think it had a lot to do with Kate Savvy um, that, that we've seen this proposal for the distribution uh, to, to us and our local operations as well. Um, uh, Matt, did you have anything to add on either operational updates regarding COVID-19 at WMATA or the, um, the, the use of federal funding? Yeah, uh, related to, to COVID, well, first and foremost, I want to echo what, what Paul just said about Kate, and in many ways, um, Kate's uh, explanations and discussion with us was clearer than what we were getting from WMATA staff. It was appreciated on this issue specifically. Um, there's obviously two components related to COVID. Um, there's Metro's actual response um, in keeping the, the system operating, albeit at a great reduction. And then there's all these fiscal issues. Um, I do wanna just take a second and thank um, Paul Smedberg for his leadership of the WMATA board during this time, which has really been unprecedented, as well as the general manager, um, and as well as all of the Metro employees, um, because, you know, we still are running the system. Um, we are um, providing essential service for 
many workers that need to get the hospitals and restaurants uh, that are doing takeout and those kinds of things. Um, and that's really valuable during this time. Um, and so thank you to all of them. Uh, there's a few things um, in addition uh, financially. Uh, the, the WMATA board, um, as you know, implemented a number of changes to fair policy for fiscal year 21, which are scheduled to go into effect um, in July. At the WMATA board meeting coming up uh, this coming Thursday, we will be discussing stepping back implementation of several of those initiatives. Um, quite frankly, with ridership down as much as 95% on rail, it just doesn't make any sense to be changing fare policy, changing weekend fares, doing some of the things with transfers that we were planning on doing in that budget. Um, there, for the most part, is a cost savings associated with not implementing those things since those most of them were revenue negative. So that will help a little bit with what the overall bill is. I do want to mention that one of the items on the table for is the Silver Line Phase 2 opening. Um, and that I mentioned this last week at the WMATA committee meeting, but um, right now in the in the FY21 budget, we have included um, startup costs associated to for phase two um, starting up on April 1st. And so that would mean that um, you know, come come July, WMATA would start hiring staff and doing training and doing all the things that they need to do to be prepared to open up in April. Um, there are potentially reasons related to the construction project for a delay and in particular um, a, a, a little bit of uncertainty regarding one outstanding issue as it relates to the concrete panels, mainly because, um, as I mentioned last week at the WMATA committee, the IG's uh, team uh, contractor out of New York City cannot actually inspect the panels in Virginia because they can't leave New York. Um, and then they're going to have to quarantine when they get here. So there's going to be a delay in getting that information. Um, and then the other issue is just both fiscally, does it make sense? And secondly, um, can WMATA actually hire staff and do training and do those things this summer? And I'm not sure we really know the answer to that one yet. But I do want to mention it because I, I would like to get feedback on that item specifically from the jurisdictional staff, um, you know, next week when we do our, our staff call leading up to the, the board meetings, if you could be thinking about um, whether you have a feeling about whether that's something we, we should do or not. Um, quite frankly, I think uh, our friends in Maryland have been advocating for this from the beginning for reasons that are sort of a little bit unrelated to COVID. Um, and we've been really resistant to that. So I just want to kind of do a level set on where we are on that issue. Um, I know that every jurisdiction is struggling financially. All of us are going to see significantly reduced revenues. That's definitely been top of mind for me and for Paul um, as we've talked to the staff. And um, this, you know, we don't know if there's going to be greater relief coming. Uh, obviously, as you pointed out, Chair Crystal, WMATA did not have to do an additional split. Um, and so the money coming is, is um, a nice gesture. Um, one discussion that we're having is if a jurisdiction is having trouble paying, um, is, does that, is that a reimbursable expense under the CARES Act because it is revenue loss for, for WMATA? So that's uh, something that WMATA staff is discussing with FTA and that continues to evolve. I expect that we'll have um, an update on that on Thursday uh, when the board meets. So I will go ahead and stop there. Um, and Madam Chair, Mr. if I Chair, could. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Smever, were you going to jump in? Yeah, yeah, just just really briefly before you open it up. Um, sure. uh, I, I agree with Matt. If we could get some clarity on or some thoughts on the, the Silver Line Phase 2. Um, and uh, just so folks are aware, we will get a, an update uh, to the Safety Committee next week at the WMATA Committee and Board, board meetings. So uh you know prior prior to that it would be helpful to to have some feedback so encourage okay. what matt said and you know start thinking about uh how you all feel about that would be helpful um and let me just ask paul and matt to be clear that the ask is not that we resolve the commission's position on this one way or another tonight but rather just that commissioners please to work with their staff and give feedback perhaps via the wilmata committee um about their jurisdictional perspective on that? So, Kate, um, uh, Katie, sorry, um, <laughs> Chair Crystal, um, no do a, uh, a call prior to the Metro board meeting, which I think will be on Monday, um, with okay. myself and Mr. Smedberg and all of the jurisdictional staff, as well as our two alternates, 
um, Mr. Gary and, and Mr. Alcorn. And um, usually on that call, we have sometimes very candid conversations about these issues and the jurisdictional staffs will give their feedback to us on those. So that's kind of the timeline. Um, I'm not sure, and, and I'm not even sure Mr. Speber knows exactly if we're going to be asked to take a position on that Thursday. Um, but in case we are, I would just kind of like to get a sense of where each jurisdiction is on it. There are financial implications. There's both positive and negative financial implications. On the positive side, when you delay civil law in phase two, obviously you don't have to incur as many costs for operations um, right away within the fiscal year. There are still gonna be startup costs depending on when it starts, but that's probably less. On the negative side, Loudoun County then is not part of the funding agreement for Metro at all in that case, which means on the capital, it gets redistributed among the jurisdictions um, Loudon's share of that would they would we would not pay and it would go to everybody else because we're no longer going to be operating the silver line in that fiscal year. So there's both positive and negatives, and we can certainly get into more detail about that. But that's that's kind of what I'm referring to. Got it. And right now the assumption is that we'll, that uh, Loudon would join and the um, subsidies or jurisdictional subsidies would be distributed accordingly for the back. Yeah. So the Lamont Board approval right? budget for FY21 has. Uh, assumes an April 1 start date. And so everybody pays operating costs starting on April 1. Um, and then there's startup costs that everybody, including Loudon pays starting July 1. And then there's um, capital costs um, for, for everyone that's associated with phase two specifically that Loudon starts paying as well on July 1. Um, Loudon does not pay the operating costs until April 1 under the current scenario. So what would happen would be there would have to be a reallocation of that money. That said, there's also going to be a reduction in costs. So I think for most jurisdictions, it would be a savings, even considering loud and now out of the equation. Um, but you know, there's also policy questions here. We've done a lot of land use planning. Do we really want to delay this another four months or more? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things to consider. So um, okay, Mr. Thank, Lucero, uh, Mr. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to uh, reorder our agenda a little bit because I think we've maybe moved into general WMATA uh, topics and, and our WMATA board members report. Um, so rather than try to barrel forward and talk next about the 3% operating subsidy cap, I, I think it might make sense to, to first, Mr. Letourneau and Mr. Smedberg, ask if you had anything else you wanted to raise with your report. And then we can open it to um, commissioner questions, feedback on the topics you just raised um, about uh, COVID-19 response at WMATA, um, allocation of federal relief funding, and general WMATA um, uh, board member report. So, um, Mr. Smedberg, um, Ms. Letourneau, was there anything else you had intended to add in your board member report? Chair Crystal, just one other thing. Uh, you know, we'll be getting an update on the budget as well on this coming Thursday. Um, you know, from staff. Um, so we'll be getting a thorough update on the, the current state of the budget. It's an FYI for folks. Okay. Yeah. And probably worth contextualizing for anybody who didn't follow the actions of the water board as breathlessly as, as some of us may have. Um, when you all adopted, I suppose about a month ago now, it was with the explicit understanding that it would be revisited prior to taking effect. So it sounds like this Thursday will be the first opportunity to begin that iterative conversation. Correct. Yeah, and just, just to add to that, Chair Crystal, I mean, the, the, the Metro Board, we've met a lot. I think we've met 14 or 15 times since February 27th. Um, and I only know that because we had to approve all the meeting minutes at once and there was like, a, <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of meetings. Um, and there been a lot of things uh, since then, including those budget items. But we have started talking about recovery as well. Um, and that we haven't had too much public discussion about that yet. I understand we may be having some on Thursday, um, but certainly a phased in approach to recovery. Um, and so, you know, that's how, how quickly that happens and what we have to plan for. One important thing is that Metro can't just flip a switch and decide, okay, now all of a sudden we have a lot more riders. We need a lot, you know, a lot more resources because we, uh, there's a there's a period that it takes time for bringing people back in. The scheduling process is typically a month in advance for the the work for the drivers and the operators. So 
all that has to be factored in to what that recovery looks like. Um, a couple other quick things. Um, I think we're going to separately talk about the Metro Rail station shutdown, so I'm not going to mention that, but um, we did approve a dedicated revenue bond resolution and authorize the issue of okay. about $545 million in Series 2028 bonds. Um, this is de dedicated capital funding by DC, Maryland, and Virginia, with the exception of $30 million from Virginia it can be used to support debt. Um, and so, you know, that was a sort of a standard thing um, for us to do. Not clear yet when or if WMATA is going to actually enter into the market and sell that debt. Um, I'm going through this with my jurisdiction right now. We're going to get our ratings, credit ratings, to, um, uh, and we are planning on on issuing debt, but we're in a lot better credit rating as are everybody else in this room than Metro is. So it's a little unclear exactly how that will move forward, but the board did authorize it so that we can continue with our, our capital program as planned. I think that's it for general items. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's really helpful. And and thank you as well for noting um, that there is a later agenda item on the, the shutdown impact mitigation. We'll be welcoming Mr. Chang of staff uh, to present a little more on that. But um, uh, let's go ahead and open the floor um, to questions about um, WMATA's COVID-19 response, distribution of the federal relief funding, or uh, general board member reports. Um, so, Mr. Bai, have we had any uh, comments coming in or any raised hands coming in um, during that presentation? Yes, we have uh, one hand raised from Mr. Turner. All right, Mr. Turner, Turner, you're duly recognized. I was wondering if you saw my little hand there. I blinked it on and caught off a couple of times to get your attention. Um, uh, it's a it's a relatively minor side point, but um, do either of you know what the long pole in the tent is? I have heard that the uh, train control system interface testing has been accelerated by the, the shutdown, um, and I don't know where we are on the gravel beds for the rail yards. Um, is the the um, uh, concrete panels, is that the long pole intent? Is that the critical factor that would cause a delay, or are, is there some synergy? Are all three working together to cause a delay? You want me I think Mr. Turner... Mr. Ahead, Turner, Paul this first. is uh, Paul Smedberg, I'll, and I'll, then I'll turn it over to Matt for his perspective. Um, you know, there are several issues that the uh, airport authority is working through with its contractors on various issues that have been highlighted. Um, the panels is obviously one of them. The software slash connection uh, between the first phase and the second phase uh, is another one. Um, and that is a critical issue, actually. Um, and they've been working through, I think it was 13 issues. Uh, several of them uh, have been addressed, or WMATA feels that they've been addressed or it can be addressed uh, within a reasonable amount of time. But there are a few issues that are outstanding still that are very significant. And the WMATA board has made it very clear uh, that we want to have a uh, reasonable resolution to these issues before we are close to accepting a project uh, because we don't want to accept something that is going to be a financial burden an operational burden and potentially a safety burden on the organization. So, um, you know, we are working collaboratively with the, the various groups and, um, uh, you know, trying to address all the issues, but some that you highlighted are clearly still of prime importance. Matt, anything else you want to add? I know. Yeah, I think, um, I think in terms of been getting updates. Right. Yeah. I think in terms of where the delay is, I mean, we are on a, on a path towards resolving most of those issues. The yeah. in control issue of integration of the two computer systems between phase one and phase two is going to get handled the summer during the shutdown. And that's a side benefit of the shutdown. The the issue with the concrete panels is a little bit unknown. I think, um, you know, as you recall, there was a, a lot of history with this. There was a whistleblower and all kinds of issues. Um, but what we don't really know is what the actual condition of those panels are. And so the inspector general um, was tasked with doing an inspection of every single panel and issuing a report. And what that would do is essentially tell Metro what the state of, what the state is of these and how much maintenance they're going to need and whether there is any kind of structural problems or anything like that. 
Um, I've heard a lot of different opinions about it, but ultimately the IG contractor is going to do this work and the delay is in getting the contractor to Virginia to be able to actually do the work right now. Um, in terms of the other issues like the ballast and the rail yard, we're gonna get an update on Thursday at the Safety and Operations Committee on exactly where those, those issues stand. So we'll know more at that point. Thank you both. All right, thank you. Any more raised hands? Madam Chair. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? No raised hands, Madam moment. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, Mr. Snyder, I'm recognizing that because you're on the phone, you don't have the ability to raise hands. So I'll, um, I don't know, you secretly have a lot of questions. Sure. Uh, thanks very much. And, and thanks to our board members for all the work you're putting in. We've raised a series of uh, revenue and, and financial issues in prior uh, meetings, and I did at the WMATA meeting. So I don't think there's a need to repeat that tonight, but I just wanted to refer to that, uh, those issues having been raised previously. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Snyder. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so we're going to move on, uh, not from WMATA, but from an, from that particular set of topics with WMATA um, and introduce and talk a little bit about um, a new initiative for our commission, which is uh, a working group on the impact of a 3% operating subsidy cap. So just a little bit of history here, um, commissioners who were with us in 2018 will remember well that among the provisions of the funding legislation in Virginia that provided dedicated capital to WMATA, um, dedicated capital funding to WMATA. Um, one of those provisions was that WMATA will now be subject to a 3% cap, and that is a cap on the annual growth in the operating subsidies that are paid by the compact jurisdiction. Um, that's generally been interpreted to mean Maryland, Virginia, and DC. Um, and of course, here in Virginia, unlike DC and Maryland, we pay as our, as our localities um, those subsidies. Uh, I think you know most of us who've been around since the 2018 legislation would would perhaps suggest that that cap has been a double-edged sword. Um, it has at times prevented um, us from from pursuing initiatives that that we and our constituents might support, um, uh, or been applied in ways that are um, uh, uh, stymie the the progress we might like to see uh, here in Northern Virginia um, with Wilmot bus and Wilmot rail. The flip side, of course, is that those of us who remember the days of the cap list. Um, subsidies know that it uh, could wreak havoc with our local budgets. Um, so I think, uh, suffice it to say, I think a lot of us feel like it's complicated. And so uh, there was a budget amendment in the 2020 session um, that I don't believe we asked for as part of our agenda, but I think does reflect um, the, the tension that, that we all feel here in Northern Virginia. Um, that amendment uh, directs the, NVC, the NVTC chair, so myself, to convene a working group to study the impact of the 3% cap and report back to the legislature with any recommendations. Um, so I wanna thank the WMATA committee chair, uh, Mr. Aguirre, and uh, the NBTC staff, as well as the WMATA committee members um, for touching base with me last week, uh, uh, and the staff for helping propose a process and a composition for the working group um, that would include um, specific touch points for the commission and the WMATA committee to be informed about how that group um, was evolving and, and what it was, uh, uh, surfacing and, and any recommendations that might be landing on. Uh, the WMATA committee discussed this at the last Thursday's meeting. We talked a little bit about the categories of people that should be on the working group. Um, you know, the, the importance of including jurisdictional staff in transportation capital planning and perhaps even finance. Um, we've been tasked by the General Assembly to include um, at least a couple of private stakeholders. We've talked about what that might involve. Um, and ultimately, it felt like the WMATA committee is the right place for this working group to report its findings so that that committee can then advise and turn the commission and we can make any recommendations. Um, this again is a really challenging subject, so I think we're welcoming the opportunity to begin surfacing some different viewpoints um, about how the cap has affected um, each of our jurisdictions and us collectively as Northern Virginia. Um, so let me invite Kate to add maybe a little more detail about the working group um, and then we can open it up for questions about um, what this group is, what they've been tasked with um, and when we can expect to hear more. So Kate, over to you, Ms. Matthijs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so indeed, based upon the feedback from Chair Crystal and the WMATA committee, um, staff will be reaching out to uh, transportations and other senior uh, staff uh, throughout our jurisdictions, as well as to DRPT Director Mitchell, and then also private sector stakeholders to engage in the work group. 
Um, our plan is that we'll be conducting interviews and small group meetings between now and the summer to hear from both these technical and budget staff to get an assessment of the impact and, and actually as the law says, understand the quote usefulness of the cap. Um, we'll also going to be reaching out to colleagues in other WMATA Compact members jurisdictions such as BC and Maryland, just for some perspective, because they are, I think, grappling with the same issues we are. Um, again, just to provide some additional background and context, but this will be a Virginia-focused product. Now, one of the things, uh, and this was a discussion last week at the WMATA committee, we recognize that the placement of the operational subsidy cap put in 2018, and, and then the most recent expansion of the exceptions to the cap that just passed the General Assembly were prior to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, and so we are very sensitive to the timing and the dynamics associated with that. Um, and we're going to be examining, you know, to the extent, extent possible, given the deadline, and this has a fall deadline uh, to the General Assembly, um, how COVID-19 impacts federal relief funding and all those things may play into a discussion of an operational cap. Um, and as Chair Crystal mentioned, staff will be summarizing the findings of the work group in a report presenting it to the WMATA Committee and the Commission for Consideration later this calendar year um, in advance of the November 10th, 2020 legislative deadline. And um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Matice. Okay, so Mr. Fai, do we see any hands raised for questions uh, on this working group? Uh, no hands are raised, Madam Chair. No hands are raised. As scintillating and as exciting as this is, all right. Um, well, that work will be continuing, we hope, in person at some point. Um, so we'll look forward to, to hearing from any members of the commission, or commissioners rather, who may have particular interests and, and multiple touch points with the WMATA committee as well, which, as a reminder, are um, always open to the public. Or excuse me, always open to the Madam public, Chair? of course, but open to any members of the commission. Madam uh, Chair, so may, uh, we have a, yes, um, uh, Director Mitchell would like to make a comment. Yeah, sorry. thank you. Um, I apologize, I was a little late getting my hand raised. Um, but just to <laughs> follow up on the, uh, the, the summary that Kate provides, which is, is very thorough. Um, you know, our understanding is this was discussed during the legislative process. Um, there, were, there was an expansion made through Delegate Watson's bill uh, to the existing cap. And during that process, I think there was a substantial amount of um, discussion among some of the jurisdictions. And I think it's fair to say that there, is not yet a um, consistent position um, towards the cap. Um, I think that it, as um, Chair Crystal mentioned, it has, it's been a double-edged sword. It's had some um, unintended consequences that um, mm -hmm. perhaps were, um, have restricted uh, the NVTC's ability or the jurisdiction's ability to accomplish during different things. I think it has also created some budgetary difficulties um, with WMATA and the other jurisdictions as well. Um, I think that what would be most useful to, out of this process is to really um, come out of this with some level of consensus, or at least a majority opinion among the NVTC jurisdictions about um, whether the cap should um, stay, whether it should uh, be modified or um, removed. And, um, I don't um, know that we have any uh, firm opinions towards any of those outcomes right now. Again, this would of course be a, re a recommendation to the General Assembly who would ultimately have to consider this. Um, but I do think that now that there are a couple years of experience um, for all of us uh, with the CAP, that this is probably a good opportunity and a good timing to look back on um, how it's worked over the past couple of years and then um, be able to make some consensus on um, how it should um, be used going forward. And that's, that's all I've got. Yeah. Director Mitchell, thank you. I think that's actually really helpful uh, legislative history here. Um, and I know we really struggled during this session when there were bills introduced regarding the cap about what our position as um, NBTC ought to be. And so I think having a little bit of space to, to convene um, subject matter experts as well as such with commissioners to, to try to work towards that consensus is um, much appreciated, and I don't that will be well used. So thank you for for sharing that. Other questions or comments? I know other ha hands raised, uh, Madam Chair. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, a couple more Omada items um, in our uh, my recognizing or reordering the agenda to recognize our Omada board members. 
Um, I failed to invite the, the chair of the um, WMATA committee, Vice Chairman uh, Garrett, to, uh, to give a report out from, from that committee. Um, so if you'd like to give any updates on that April 30th committee meeting, um, uh, Kenneth, that'd be great. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so back on April 30th, we got to be the guinea pig for uh, having virtual meetings, <laughs> but the WMATA committee met on the 30th. And in addition to the 3% cap discussion, we also had an update on the COVID-19 CARES Act, which we have already covered in this meeting. So I won't uh, rehash this. And uh, we also discussed the 2020 update to the annual report on the performance and condition of WMATA. Uh, and RTC is required to provide an annual report on the performance and condition of WMATA. This report provides key financial, reliability, and ridership performance data, as well as the uses of Virginia's dedicated capital funding to WMATA. The report also provides strategies to reduce the growth in costs and improve operating efficiencies in WMATA. Um, this chapter will provide MVTC with an opportunity to state its policy priorities uh, for these strategies. After much discussion, uh, the committee directed staff to make a major update to the report by providing context for COVID-19 related data and policy impacts. While conditions are still uncertain for WMATA during this crisis, the committee felt that it was vitally important for the report to be as contextually relevant as possible, as this report will be delivered to the governor and general assembly in December. Um, and I'll just add, you know, there's just so much flux going on. Um, I think there was, it was pretty unanimous in the consensus that anything within this report really has to tie back to some of the effects of, of COVID-19. Um, I also want to convey that because the data included in the report often lags by a few years, the effects of COVID-19 on ridership and performance data will only begin to be felt in the 2020 report, with the bulk of the impacts in future reports. Every TC staff will explore what this update could look like, and we will discuss at a future committee meeting um, as well. And uh, that is all for my report for the WMATA committee, and happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, if you wouldn't mind standing by, Mr. Vice Chair, I think uh, what I might do is go next into the station shutdown and mitigation strategy update, um, and then we can invite any questions on, on that or, or any other work of the WMATA committee at the same time. Um, so uh, let me, we're going to move then into that, that update um, and uh, provide an opportunity to introduce not only the topic, but to reintroduce uh, the team member who has been really doing pretty heroic work in this area. So, so uh, Ms. Vintice, over to you to tell us a little bit about um, what Matt Chang has been up to before introducing him. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and indeed, I want to give a, a quick introduction to uh, one of the NPT staff who has been really instrumental um, in uh, ensuring that all of the right organizations, localities, um, right level of staff are at the table. Um, and this is both last year as well as this year um, in our regional response to Met Metro's platform improvement project, uh, both the shutdown and the mitigation plan. So Matt Chang, who actually started uh, as a transit fellow at NVTC a couple years ago, um, he's actually leading and managing our regional coordination efforts uh, for this among his many talents. Uh, Matt is an incredibly detail-oriented analyst um, who's really made sure, again, that the right people are at the table for these discussions. Um, even as the scope of the shutdown has changed, um, he's regularly coordinating calls that can have close to 80 individuals on them um, and has really provided a meaningful venue for regional staff uh, to roll up their sleeves and solve problems. And again, this is all geared towards uh, clear and seamless options for the public who will be affected by the shutdown this summer. Um, so I want to turn this over to Matt. He just has a couple of slides. Um, it's purely a very tip of the iceberg of all the work that he's been putting into this. Um, and then what I, it sounds like Madam Chair is, is following his remarks will open up for any questions. I also do want to point out in addition to Matt Chang, um, Greg Potts uh, from WMATA is also available uh, to answer questions on our call. Um, so Matt, do you want to dive in? Yeah, uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, this is Matt Chang, MBTC Program Analyst. And first, I will give an overview of the Summer 2020 Platform Improvement Project in general, and then go on to brief about MBTC's regional coordination effort. So next slide. As you know, this summer begins phase two of WMATA's Platform Improvement Project to reconstruct 20 outdoor station platforms across the Metro Rail system. This summer, WMATA will, will replace concrete and conduct station renewal at four Orange Line stations, East Falls Church, West Falls Church, Dunmore, and Vienna. 
fleet station closure begins on May 23rd. However, WMATA has already begun construction due to some of the stations being closed for the COVID-19 health emergency. And during the main construction phase, WMATA will be installing completely new platform edges, replacing concrete, replacing all station flooring with non-slip tile, as well as updating customer amenities, such as information screens and lighting. And during the main project closure, the orange line will run between Boston and New, and New Carrollton only, and there will be no silver line trains. Instead, customers uh, taking the orange line when traveling, should take the orange line when traveling in DC, uh, Maryland, and the Roth and Boston corridor. And WMATA is also uh, committed to provide three bus shuttles initially during this closure, all of which will be free. Next slide. Initially, the Orange Line local shuttle will ser serve as all met Orange Line Metro Rail stations except East Falls Church. The Orange Line Express will provide direct service from Vienna to Boston so that riders can access the Metro Rail system directly. The Silver Line local shuttle will serve as Silver Line stops, including Wheelie Reston and Titans, connecting to them to Boston. Um, Metro is planning on closing the Silver Line completely during the shutdown to expedite the Silver Line Phase 2 tie-in and simplify rail operations, construction, and testing, as Mr. Letourneau noted earlier. Um, WMATA plans to maintain current levels of Metro Rail service in the Orange Line, 20 minutes during the weekdays and 30 minutes during the weekends at the start of the shutdown. This is reflective of the most current COVID-19 Metro Rail system service levels. However, this may change during the summer if rail service is mandated to return to pre-pandemic levels. I should also note that this map shows some stations on the orange and silver line that are bypassed by the shuttles, such as McLean, uh, East Falls Church, or Greensboro. Um, this is because the stations that these stations are currently closed for rail service due to the COVID-19 health emergency, having significantly lower ridership. And I'll, I will note that WMATA has designed the shuttle plan to be scalable and flexible. So if some point during the summer, the stations were to reopen and demand returns, then they were to incorporate these currently closed stations into the shuttle plan as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so MBTC's role uh, leading up to and throughout the shutdown has been to facilitate a regional coordination group led by WMATA and made up of local transportation agencies, the Commonwealth, first responders, bus operators, and communication staff. We hold regular coordination calls and meetings so that your jurisdictional staff can ask questions directly to the WMATA project managers, coordinate on communications and service, share resources and best practices. This is an, also an opportunity to report on parallel projects that could affect the shutdown, such as the I-66 widening or Boston multimodal project. Um, we have held these coordination, regional coordination stakeholder meetings since before the shutdown was announced in, in December, and we'll continue to hold them until the stations are reopened. And as Kate mentioned, we also conducted a similar coordination and review process for the blue and yellow line shutdown last summer. And we had hoped that some of the lessons learned from the last summer shutdown and mitigation strategies that worked well would be able to transfer to this summer shutdown. And however, due to the COVID-19 situation, uh, many of these strategies that were planned within our coordination group, such as the in-person outreach, town hall events, as well as extra jurisdictional bus service, are not really possible due to social distancing or, or pause until travel restrictions are lifted. And WMATA and our partners are still making an aggressive communications push, still providing a flexible shuttle plan, but some of the local mitigation strategies that worked really well last summer, um, such as the TDM, the transit and business incentives, are not really applicable with our current travel restrictions and telework being enforced. And obviously the next greatest concern is the coordination and the, of the expanded shutdown of the Silver Line, as well as ensuring that there are enough resources to provide seats to riders if travel restrictions are lifted and demand for commuting along the Orange and Silver Line corridor returns significantly. And to that end, WMATA is working with their local agencies to right side some of their shuttle service and planning for service contingencies. But the challenge right now is coming up and sharing new mitigation uh, strategies and, and transit services in such a short amount of time that complement the WMATA shuttles given the uncertainty about future ridership and the availability of jurisdictional uh, transit service during this project. And I know this was discussed at WMATA committee last week, and we are working to ensure that both commissioner and staff concerns from uh, that meeting are addressed. So right now, uh, members of the jurisdictional group are coordinating on updated communications on the project so that the public may be informed of the extended shutdown and work 
that is going on on the Orange Line stations before the May 23rd start date. And we are also monitoring our local bus recovery to see if the routes run by Fairfax Connector, Omni Ride, and Loudoun County Transit that serve the affected stations could restart during the platform project. And this could potentially give returning commuters better options to transverse the shutdown area completely. Um, each jurisdiction, of course, will still determine whether they can resume transit services that are affected by the Orange Line shutdown and Silver Line shutdown. But we're going to continue to share resources and coordinate regionally uh, on the transit recovery during this project. And finally, WMATA is working with the group to keep them informed about the platform construction progress and schedule given the project work restrictions. Our, our next coordination call is next Tuesday, May 12th, and I believe many of your staff are on that call. And that concludes my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions on regional coordination. And again, I believe Greg popped some line to answer any WMATA specific uh, questions. Great, Mr. Chen, so, thank you so, so much. I um, uh, also want to thank Mr. Potts for being available. Um, I know this has been a, a hot topic, although I don't know that any of us could have anticipated that um, ridership would have taken such a, a dramatic hit uh, with social distancing that this may not have been uh, the, the challenge we thought it would be this summer. Um, nevertheless, I think it's really encouraging to know that this uh, coordination and collaboration continues. Um, so uh, hopefully we've had a few hands raised during that presentation, but um, let me encourage anybody else who'd like to comment to, to raise a hand now um, and to go to Mr. Fai to ask whether we have any comments. Madam Chair, we don't have any hands raised. Okay. Um, Madam okay. Chair, Dave Snyder. Please. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I, I, I didn't want to let this topic get passed without uh, a couple of comments. Um, from the standpoint of City of Falls Church, we find ourselves paying for Metro service we're not getting, and in other cases, not getting any service at all. So there's, I'm hearing increasing amounts of um, frustration uh, from, um, from my constituents. So I want to uh, pass that on, and mm. we're committed to continuing to work through this, but uh, is not working real well for the city of Falls Church right now, nor in the foreseeable future. But let me let me get more um, specific here as to wh what's the public really going to expect here. So we we have no basically no metro service whatsoever in East Falls Church. What I've heard is the shuttles aren't even going to stop there as long as the station is closed. And how it was selected to be closed, I guess, was some sort of triage done uh, by the metro system. I'm wondering what the metrics are for reopening East Falls Church and then establishing some sort of service for the customers that ordinarily use that station. The, um, the, the, the second question I have is that employers are starting to ask, you know, what do they really expect here? And it sounds to me like on the orange line, those stations and social distancing, as long as that's mandated on shuttles. I mean, how many people can you get on a typical shuttle vehicle? So mm. it seems to me the message is pretty much um, if you're teleworking, you better stay teleworking because there isn't going to be very much effective service for you uh, on Metro in a large part of Northern Virginia. So maybe um, the Metro folks can answer some of those questions that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I might ask Mr. Potts if you could respond, particularly the, the criteria for reopening or, or some of the other questions Mr. Steiner has flagged here. Sure, this is Greg Potts from Metro. So on the first question from Mr. Snyder on the criteria for reopening the stations, as was mentioned, 19 stations are currently closed because of COVID. I think Mr. Letourneau mentioned that the board is going to be receiving some more information next week on recovery. So I think you're going to be hearing more about that and what the criteria is going to be. And obviously Metro is working with the local authorities, state authorities, federal as well, and on coordination with them, what the region looks like. Of course, it's a complicated region because you have two governors and a mayor, so we're all working with them together. Um, so you're going to hear more on that, but obviously that is a concern. We've heard that um, not only from uh, Falls Church, and Arlington about East Falls Church, but also from Fairfax County about the Greensboro and the McLean stations, which are also closed right now in the Silverland corridor. So more to follow on that on the criteria. Um, the second thing, the second question was on what you expect for customers 
social distancing, et cetera. That's also something that the safety office is working with the bus planners on. So they're getting more guidance on that. On the shuttles themselves, they tend to carry around 50 to 55 passengers. So we have to manage those loads. Obviously, you don't want to have full buses this summer. That would not be a good idea. Um, so they're expecting, um, you know, to um, hopefully manage to have at least half of those buses full, um, but we're going to get more specific criteria on that, on what to expect. Um, and so, you know, I think, again, you're going to be hearing uh, more on that. There is a, Metro has got a um, pandemic task force that's going to be getting recommendations on this. So more to follow. Thank you so much, Mr. Potts. Appreciate that. Mr. Strider, thank you for raising those questions. Uh, sure. Thank you. Anxieties of new writers. Did you want to follow up? I did not just wanted to thank everybody for working in these very difficult conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Fai, any other questions coming over the chat line? Yes, the, we have uh, uh, two Yes, we have uh, two commissioners on standby, Mr. Faust and Ms. Palchik. Okay, thank you. Mr. Faust, we'll go to you first. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I uh, given the presentation on Silver Line, I just didn't want to remain silent, uh, although I don't necessarily feel what I have to say is going to make much difference. Uh, I don't understand why they're uh, the Silver Line is being shut down completely. Uh, the case has not been made, in my opinion, uh, to the extent coordinating with Phase 2 is important. That's been part of the planning for years. Uh, and you know, I am concerned that I feel like the decisions that are being made are for the convenience of Metro. And I think we got to start thinking about the people who used to ride Metro and worry more about their convenience. And so, uh, you know, I, I, again, the issue has been raised, the decision has been made, no one was asked, no communication that I'm aware of from the field certainly uh, within the, the board at Metro, there was obviously discussion, uh, but I did not want to, you know, I don't, I don't feel like making this point because I don't think it is going to have any effect at all, but I'm not going to sit here silently and watch my constituents have to scramble if and when the economy goes back. I mean, we are, if this Metro's failure to deliver transit service hurts our recovery at all. I'm not going to be a happy camper. And we got an economy that we've got to get back. Uh, people have got will be going back to work. And you know the the transit system that we just spent six billion dollars uh, to build on the Silver Line uh, won't be there for them. So that. That's it. Uh, it's been no question, no uh, no expectation. Just uh, a very frustrated uh, statement uh, with how, with respect to how I think uh, we're being treated. Mr. Goss, thank you. I'm going to let Mr. Letourneau maybe speak to that because I know he's been spending a ton of time conversing and thinking and working on this issue with regarding the Silver Lines inclusion and the shutdown. So, Mr. Letourneau, did you want to add? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, to Supervisor Faust, I I feel your pain truly because um, you know at the moment Reston Wheelie is the entire of Loudoun County's lifeline to the metro system. Um, it's our closest station. It's how most of our residents access it. So as you can imagine, when the general manager um, began informing uh, the board of this decision, I had a lot of questions. I had some frustrations. Um, and um, I, you know, I, I really wanted to get at why. And I think ultimately what it really came down to um, and we can argue the point, but none of us really have this technical expertise, is um, they didn't feel like they could safely do the construction itself under social distancing guidelines unless the stations were completely closed. 
Um, it was always going to be very difficult, more difficult than I realized until I got on the board to keep the silver line running while the orange line platforms are being replaced. Um, the logistics behind that are really, really complicated. And again, a lot more complicated than I realized. Um, they became even more complicated when every construction worker is supposed to be staying um, a certain number of feet from each other. And also because um, Metro would have control of the site still and have to be directly involved with all the actions of the contractors. And so the, the really the capital division is the one that I think first really advanced this recommendation from the standpoint of if they didn't do this, they believe that the platform reconstruction project itself would take a lot longer. They had concerns about actually getting contractors to do the work. Um, and they felt that having two tracks available to them at all times was going to allow them to move equipment in and out and, and, and actually keep to the schedule. As it is, there will be interruptions. There's supply chain interruptions. I know all of us in our jurisdictions are probably hearing about construction and how things are going and whether our capital projects are moving. For Metro, their capital projects are moving, but their supplies aren't necessarily getting there. For instance, um, those nice new uh, signs, assuming they're in the right font, that were installed in the new platforms last, last year, those aren't going to be part of this project this summer because that supplier is in a part of China that's not shipping. So they are running into those issues, kind of issues still. Um, but ultimately, although you're, you're absolutely right about the silver line, I don't think that alone is the driver for this. It was really the ability to actually do the project. Um, and I didn't feel like ultimately I could really argue that point because um, we were, you know, Metro made the case that it was necessary. So that's, you know, agree or not. I just wanted to share that with you. And I understand why you're frustrated. And I am too, and I would be too if I were you. Thanks, Ms. Wittrenau. Um, that's Thank helpful to know that's complicated. Um, I think we have quite a few other hands raised. So I, I know Commissioner Palchuk was next in line. So why don't we start with you, Ms. Palchuk? Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I'll try to be brief and I appreciate the context. Um, I also, I, as I joined the WMATA committee last week and shared my concerns, um, I do wanna thank um, Matt Letourneau, Matt Chang, uh, Greg Potts, and the others who have helped us try to coordinate and improve the communication. You know, it, it was pretty uh, disappointing um, and frustrating, and I share that with, with my colleagues who've spoken, uh, especially that initial really lack of communication um, and kind of confusing communication as to what the reasoning was and what the timeline and coordination would be. Um, so to that, you know, we, we did have two calls today, both with our, our offices as well as with um, the Tyson's partnership, which as you know, are the business community very reliant on this Metro um, and, and trying to plan for reopening. Um, and this added a whole new wedge that I think as John mentioned, um, makes it just so much more difficult for the reopening. Um, that being said, you know, I am hopeful and I wanna continue to work with this progress we're making. Um, and just want to voice, uh, especially to, to Greg and the WMATA partners here, that we continue that communication. You know, I'm hopeful that we can um, improve the, the, the short-term and the long-term outcomes um, and continuing to shift um, the plans for outreach to our new virtual platforms, um, to our constituents, also to our business partners. Uh, and I, I think we've made some good progress today. Um, and I think that kind of the, the remaining big questions, which we've been told there's more information coming, so I really am hopeful that it is coming soon, uh, will be for the safety guidelines, both for our riders and for our employees, um, and also the timelines. And I think this was shared by my two previous colleagues, you know, really prioritizing being able to get the East Falls Church and the Silver Line back on track as soon as possible, because um, that is something that was not planned for and quite detrimental um, and just being able to to count on that coordination moving forward. So I just wanted to share that uh, publicly and hope that that continues and uh, looking forward to to working with MVTC and with our WMATA partners on those initiatives. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Palchuk, and um, thank you for your diligent work with the committee as well uh, to try to follow through on these issues that are affecting your constituents as well. Um, Mr. Fai, I think we've got a couple of other raised hands, so um, let me turn it to you to, to call on the next commissioner. Yes, uh, Commissioner McKay. Thank you very much, and I, I just want to associate myself with the comments of my two colleagues, Supervisor Faust and Supervisor Palchik. Um, you know, obviously, this is going to have a pretty big impact on a lot of people and the coordination uh, with the Tyson's partnership that Supervisor Palchik raised is going to be important throughout the process, not just at the beginning, but throughout the process. Um, and I, I, too, am interested in if there's any ways to tighten the time frame. Um, we certainly can't have the time frame slide and get any worse. Um, I'm hopeful that there's that we're looking at strategies to to try to tighten that. I mean, it's pretty clear that the governor is going to begin reopening the economy here pretty soon. And obviously that, you know, we're hoping people will go back to public transportation uh, at some point. And I think we have to monitor that against the timelines and, and do the best we can. I guess my question is, is and, and I you know, preach this a lot with the yellow and blue line closing is having WMATA think about ways to incentivize people who are impacted to get back into the system. Um, the shuttle service that is going to be run is going to be, you know, insufficient to lure uh, people into the rail system. Those are people who, you know, likely have no other way to get around. But for the people who have options when the work is finished, we really need to be thinking about an incentive package for that corridor, uh, either reduced parking or reduced fares, uh, or do something to show the system's appreciation for all the people who have been impacted. Uh, with the growth we're having in Tyson's Corner, uh, you know, we're going to have one shot uh, for some of these people to get back on the rail system. And if we really want the kind of robust ridership to return and grow over the long term, uh, we need to be thinking about what we can do to welcome those people back with open arms and give them an incentive to get back on the system. And we should be thinking about those things now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. McKay. I know we've had a lot of conversations around the NVTC table about trying to incent riders to come back and um, certainly a, a disappointment that just as that ridership was really returning, starting to return to, to see this happen. So. I think that's a point well taken about looking for ways to um, incent riders as, as the economy reopens. Um, Mr. Pye, I think we had a couple of others, right? Um, no, that's it, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you all for the good conversation. I'm pleased we were able to at least raise some of those things, albeit virtually. Um, I think I'm going to give one more pause for any comments or questions. Okay. Um, seeing that, I believe our next item is a, a brief update on the, um, the fare collection update, um, which is just to say that this item was provided as a written report, um, and we expect that staff are going to be giving us a, fair, a presentation on fare collection at a future meeting, which remains a strong topic of interest for a lot of us um, uh, around the region as well as at NBTC. Um, and we do anticipate that, that COVID-19 may as well, uh, may in addition, have impacts on the way fares are collected on buses especially. Um, so we are looking forward to, to more on that. Um, moving on then from WMATA, um, we have uh, the Department of Rail and Public Transportation report, and we're so delighted that um, Director Mitchell is able to join us. So I'm going to turn to you, Director Mitchell, for your report from DRPT. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair Crystal. Um, I, we do have a written report that covers um, a number of later latest updates, but I do want to address um, probably the most significant one related to um, our six-year plan. Uh, the uh, there was a uh, governor's budget amendment number 110, um, which was included in the approved budget, which would allow um, the Commonwealth Transportation Board to leave the existing um, uh, six-year plan in place um, for a period up until June 30th, 2021, or until um, a new uh, six-year plan can be adopted. Um, at this point, we do not have a revised schedule for um, when uh, this will occur. It's really going to depend on when future information is provided um, related to the statewide revised revenue forecast. Um, 
as has been uh, stated publicly by Secretary Lane, um, they're looking to potentially provide a new revenue forecast in 60 to 90 days when this, um, when the impacts of COVID-19 are much clearer on the state budget. The budget amendment did allow uh, DRPT, however, to allocate state operating dollars if needed. Um, we are currently evaluating our next steps um, as it relates to that, uh, particularly in light of also some of the federal care, CARES Act funding. Um, and um, one, one thing I do want to note is uh, for those of you that are familiar with how the uh, Transportation Trust Fund is now structured following the omnibus bill, um, all of the funds are now, uh, the, there's about eight funding sources that go into the Transportation Trust Fund, and they're now consolidated into a single pot, whereas before there were certain funding sources directed into certain uh, modes and pots of money. Um, there now, uh, our Mass Transit Trust Fund receives a portion of the overall transportation trust fund, 23%. Uh, our rail fund gets 7.5% uh, of the overall transportation trust fund. And within um, the Mass Transit account of that, um, the, the amount of funding that we provide to NVTC for um, offsets for the WMATA subsidy is actually 46.5% of our uh, of the statewide mass transit trust fund. Um, the reason I'm pointing that out is because any, um, now that our shares are essentially based on a percentage, um, as the entire trust fund um, goes, as will those percentages um, in each bucket go as well. Um, under the current, um, the way that the transportation trust fund is structured, under current, um, Legislation, and I think there's going to be more information about that um, following the um, in our legislative report uh, next on the agenda. Um, as it stands right now, the CTB does not have the authority to um, to shift funds from one pot of money into another pot of funds, in um, unless there was additional action taken by the General Assembly to allow that to happen. Um, so, just that is something that's also impacting. Um, our evaluation of next steps and um, how we're going to move forward in terms of future allocations from our six year fund. So um, certainly as additional information is made available, we'll make sure that um, you all are updated. We're very sensitive to the fact that many of you are currently adopting or in the processes of adopting revised budgets. Um, and so we do wanna be able to provide as much information and certainty to you as we can, um, but really it's, it's all gonna be based on uh, when we'll have additional information about um, uh, the forecast for the statewide budget. Um, and with that, I will conclude my report. Director Mitchell, thank you. I think that was a good summary of some questions that are um, on a lot of minds about uh, uh, the, um, whether the, the, all of the exciting new initiatives and, and funding sources and the transportation on the bus. So we appreciate that. And, um, I also just want to take the, the opportunity, since I don't think we've assembled to say it, um, how, how much we appreciate uh, uh, your very quick work, DRPT's very quick work, um, and the CTB's very quick work to, to deliver um, financial relief to transit operators for our first month of losses. Um, I think it was probably one of the swiftest forms of relief we saw from state or federal government, and, and we really appreciate your, your thinking of us um, during those trying early weeks. Um, do we have any questions or comments for Director Mitchell? on that DRPT update. No hands are raised, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, well, not unrelated to that update, we, we do have some space on the agenda for a legislative update as well. So, so please do be thinking about um, questions if you've got any uh, uh, on this legislative update or um, questions for Director Mitchell. Um, we're delighted to be joined by um, Amy Perrin Siebert, uh, our, our faithful and, and very effective legislative liaison. Um, down in Richmond to, to give a, a General Assembly update. Um, and then Ms. Matthijs actually will have a federal update for us as well. Um, and then finally, we're gonna return to um, uh, Mr. Kwakoff, I think, for an overview of what we're expecting to see with the revenue sources that fund our transit system. So again, please be thinking about questions or comments. We're gonna let all three of those speakers give brief presentations um, and then we'll go to the phone. So um, uh, Ms. Pranzi, I think we're beginning with you, welcome. Hi, Chair Crystal, thank you. I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, hope everybody can hear me just fine. 
Um, I'm actually going to be fairly brief tonight. I think um, a lot of things have already been covered. I know Zach did a great job in the report that you guys have here. Um, and obviously, Director Mitchell also sort of just ran through some of the issues that happened during the veto session in the governor's amendments um, to uh, have to delay some of the funding issues in the omnibus transportation bill. Um, obviously, we had veto session on April 22nd, which was a very um, a different veto session, as uh, Senator Evan, I'm sure, can uh, attest to with legislators being in two different locations and some of them being outside. Uh, so we had a um, successful day though, everything got done. Uh, the biggest thing that we did obviously uh, that we worked on during that time for MBTC was making sure that we could have this electronic meeting. So um, we were therefore successful, successful. and um, I wanna thank Senator Eben as well as um, Steve McIsaac for all their help uh, in making that happen. There was a, a lot of people and a lot of folks in the background that made that um, come together, which we really appreciate. So we're happy that was, that was here. Um, one of the other things that did happen, I think just a couple other items. Again, most things are were, were delayed. If anything happened at all, we had the issue with the peer-to-peer -peer vehicle rental tax, which we were uh, involved in this year in the General Assembly. Uh, that has now been delayed until October um, 1st, 2020. Um, there's just a lot of items that have been delayed uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis. And so I think all we're doing right now is doing a lot of um, you know, monitoring what's happening and trying to pay attention to what we can do with the general assembly, uh, with the general assembly members and the administration, frankly, with um, how we can help and what we can do. I think obviously Kate's been doing a great job with, with director Mitchell and all the items that we have um, that are kind of out there right now. Everything's in a in a real state of abeyance, and we're just trying to figure out what we can um, what we can do and, and work on. So. Um, I know we didn't talk too much about the rail authority, but I know that's moving forward. Um, they're looking for folks to be appointed to that. And um, you know, we're really excited about that piece as well from an MBTC and VRE standpoint as well. So um, with that, I think I will stop. because I think Scott's issue is probably the thing that people are most interested in is finding out what the impact is gonna be on gas tax um, in Kate's uh, federal update. I think that's that's right. So Amy, thank you so much. Um, I think we're gonna go next then to Kate to talk about the federal space before we have Scott give the overview of all the funding sources. So um, Ms. Matej. Thank you so much. And indeed, very quickly, obviously we talked uh, about the CARES Act uh, insofar as related to WMATA, but sort of the bigger picture um, on March 27th, the president did sign a $2.2 trillion emergency relief package that included 25 billion in funds for transit operators, which is, uh, I mean, unprecedented, as in I probably word this used a lot these times, but um, it was immediate relief uh, to transit operators who are in the federal program. So those are federal transit administration grantees. And for the Washington DC area, that means uh, funding available directly to WMATA, VRE, and then OmniRide, PRTC. Um, and so there's actually some information within your materials how those funds broke out. They were all basically done by formula allocation. But what it means is all three of those operators have access to these federal funds at 100% uh, federal share and can be used for any of the expenses, including operating expenses, which is pretty much unprecedented for uh, federal programs, uh, usually in large urban areas. Uh, the federal, federal government only provides capital money. This can be used for operations. Um, so again, those are things that WMATA, VRE, and PRTC are actively working on. Uh, but one of the things that actually sort of late breaking uh, news is that the big trade association that supports public transportation, which is called APTA, the American Public Transportation Association, they actually are uh, calling on Congress and actually just sent a letter today um, asking for an additional $23.8 billion um, in emergency response and recovery funding for transit. Part of that is I think there is a recognition that while the initial 25 billion may seem like an awful lot of money from the federal space, uh, it is clearly around the country, uh, the costs uh, associated with lost revenues, um, as well as making protecting the workers um, is, is quite astronomical. In fact, a study that APTA did found that, um, that there's over four, something like over $40 billion still in, um, in lost revenues um, and costs that are associated with the transit industry. So what the recent, uh, the new ask by APTA is urging Congress to provide 23.8 billion, uh, 19 billion of that would be put into um, FTA's emergency relief program, which would be specifically uh, to those agencies who demonstrate that they have already exceeded what was provided in the first uh, set of funding. Uh, so this would be an additional relief uh, and the second part of it would be some additional formula funding that would go to everybody. Now, granted, this is an ask. It has not been acted upon, uh, but uh, 
there's clearly a recognition um, of the role of public transit as well as the, uh, the huge losses both to the state and local revenues that support transit as well as riders. Um, so we'll obviously be tracking that legislation um, and if necessary, uh, working with all of you to send some support uh, to Congress to move forward on that piece of legislation. Um, that's all I have from the federal side. Um, and so I'm happy to turn this over to Scott, um, who is going to talk about um, really in generalities, but recognizing the various revenue pieces that go into our funding for transit um, and the things that we're tracking. Scott. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so at this point, of course, there's much uncertainty about the impact COVID-19 will have on transit funding for NBTC. But I would like to talk a little bit about NBTC's transit revenue sources and what we do know at this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excluding the commuter choice program, NBTC has two funding sources for our jurisdiction's transit use. These include assistance through DRBT and then the NDTC regional gas tax, which is administered by the Department of Motor Vehicles. The majority of MBTC's assistance is through DRPT, which last year, for example, equaled about 85% of our transit revenue, with the regional gas tax making up the difference. So for DRPT funding for NBTC, this includes operating and capital assistance for our local systems, as well as assistance to help our jurisdictions fund their shares of WMATA's operating and capital needs. As Director Mitchell just reported, the six-year improvement program, which shows the statewide allocations, including to NVTC, will be delayed. So not until revised state revenue forecast and the fiscal year 21 SIP are released in the coming months will we really have an idea of how much assistance NVTC could expect. And so while the um, NBTC regional gas tax plays a smaller role than our DRPT assistance, it is still an important revenue source to help our jurisdictions meet the WMATA funding requirements. The regional gas tax revenue has been somewhat flat for the past couple of years due to a price floor that's been in effect. Before COVID-19, gross revenues totaled about $54 million annually. But from that, each month, a fixed dollar amount is withheld by the Commonwealth for WMATA dedicated funding and for the VRE CROC fund. This totals about 19 million annually, leaving NVTC with 65% of the gross collections. As part of the trans Transportation Omnibus Funding Bill, the fixed amount increased to about 28% effective July 1st, leaving NVTC with a little less than 50% of the gross collections. So the important point of this is that if collections were to drop by 65% in a given month this fiscal year, it would mean NVTC doesn't see any revenue in that month since the state's share comes off the collections first. And starting in July, NVTC will not see any revenue if collections are at about 50% of the pre-COVID-19 levels. To date, um, DMV does not have updated revenue projections and the drop in revenues generated in March will not even be known until the end of this month. However, the U.S. Energy Information Administration and others report around a 40 to 50 percent drop in demand for gasoline nationwide. Now, how that translates to the MBTC region will be known over the next few months. So as more information becomes available, we will, of course, be closely monitoring the impact on MBTC gas collections and our DRPT assistance. That's all I have, thank you. Mr. Quokar, thank you. Um, and thank you as well to uh, Ms. Karen Siebert and, um, and Ms. Matthijs for providing those updates. Um, let me see if we have any questions. This is a lot to process. Obviously, it was a big legislative session overshadowed only by the significant um, events of recent months since then. So thank you all for the summaries there. Um, Mr. Fai, any, any uh, hands up over the, uh, over the phone lines? No hands raised, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I will, if you have any other questions, I'll give another moment for those to come over while I talk a little bit more about the passenger rail authority that Amy uh, highlighted. Uh, so many of you may remember from the fall that um, uh, we had a, an incredibly exciting set of announcements about acquisition of track and right-of-way from TSX um, with the goal of being able to pretty dramatically expand rail service, uh, not only in the Northern Virginia region, but, but well across the Commonwealth. Um, that uh, significant new acquisition 
um, for the Commonwealth has come with the need for governance structure for it. And so the transit omnibus legislation created a Virginia Passenger Rail Authority, which will have the ability to own, construct, acquire, and lease track and rail facilities. Um, it's also going to be able to collect track lease fees, issue debt, borrow money for capital purposes. Um, and as mandated by an amendment to the budget, the rail authority is also going to be required to provide initial oversight of the proposed terms of the Long Bridge Project Agreement, which has been the subject of much discussion here at the commission, um, and provide continuing oversight of, of uh, bond issuance and the sale of any land to the MEI Commission. Um, so this authority is going to be governed by a 15-member board that includes three members who reside within the boundaries of NBTC of our jurisdiction. The rest of the members are listed in your meeting materials. Um, these are not elected officials. I know the, um, uh, I can ask uh, Secretary, uh, uh, Director Mitchell to speak more, but um, the goal is not to create another uh, uh, um, elected official governing body like we see with VRE or NBTC, um, but rather to create something more akin to the Port Authority for the Commonwealth. Um, uh, nevertheless, we hope and expect that the authority will be a close partner to NBTC, um, certainly in our role as uh, one of the parent commissions of VRE, which is going to be probably in the interim the primary um, beneficiary, at least in Northern Virginia, of uh, the new track access. Um, so in our role as, as parent of VRE, um, and then of course just in our role um, as the, uh, the hub of, of transit planning and policy um, for Northern Virginia. Um, and so in that spirit of partnership, we really appreciate um, that the legislation that created the authority also gave us the opportunity as NBTC to provide a list of recommended names to represent NBTC jurisdictions on the authority. Um, again, our jurisdictions holistically, um, it is not intended to be a, a representative from each locality. Um, we'll present that list for consideration to the governor who is ultimately gonna appoint the, the 12 non-legislative board members. Um, so that is quite a bit of preamble. Essentially what we're asking is that for your help um, in thinking of individuals you would recommend um, that you know of from, from your work on this body, uh, in your home jurisdictions or in other regional bodies. Um, again, we're looking for not elected officials. Um, I'll turn next to Director Mitchell to talk about what type of qualifications we're looking for. Um, but we would love to see some folks that, that we know um, strongly understand the needs and opportunities of transit, especially rail and commuter rail transit. Uh, in Northern Virginia to, to be represented. And uh, our list of recommendations is the opportunity to do that. Um, so uh, before I talk about next steps on that, Director Mitchell, um, have I characterized that accurately? Would you add anything else about um, the, the types of individuals, you know, the governor is, is looking to appoint to this new rail authority? Sure, um, and thank you. Uh, we are, um, we're in the process now of um, getting the rail authority mobilized. And as part of that, we are working with um, uh, some consultants that we've brought in to assist us in setting up the um, authority's governance structure and um, reviewing best practices. And we've actually been doing quite a bit of um, interviews with um, other transport, other similar rail authorities uh, across the country and also similar transportation authorities within Virginia as well. Um, what we've been hearing Sort of, sort of across the board as, as best practices is that um, it's very important to, with a body like this that will have a um, much more of a direct, well, they won't be directly operating service, they will be um, really managing assets and um, executing a very large capital program and a very large construction program, and then also um, uh, entering into long-term agreements with operators like Leary and um, Amtrak as well, that um, we should really seek to appoint people that have a variety of interests beyond uh, certainly rail um, expertise is gonna be very valuable. Um, understanding uh, transportation and, and transit within Northern Virginia, obviously very essential. Um, however, we are looking for people as well that have very strong um, legal backgrounds, financial backgrounds, uh, business backgrounds as well. Um, in my estimation, and, and I should note as well that the legislation has established that the DRPT director will serve as the chair of the board, but in a non-voting capacity, um, unless in the event of a tie. So there will still be a very, very strong um, and tight relationship between the rail authority, DRPT, and the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Um, with that said, so we, we are looking for um, suggestions and names and um, 
you know, again, keeping in mind that um, a variety of expertise and background will be, um, I think, very appreciated and um, and certainly as well because the um, there's obviously a huge uh, the real authority will have a big role in Northern Virginia um, as it's expanding the. Um, the Virginia Passenger Rail Initiative, and also working with VRE to expand service, um, but also to have the ability to um, look at things in a very much a statewide picture as well. Um, so I think, yeah, that, I think that sum, summarizes it, and we really do appreciate your input and um, look forward to receiving some suggestions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell, for that good summary. I understand from our team that I was breaking up in most of my description, so I'm glad that you did it better than I could have anyway about the types of individuals we're looking for. Um, so the ask for you all as commissioners is to give this a thought um, about whom you would like to see added to our list of recommendations. Um, please do send those names to myself or to Kate um, because of the, the time sensitivity um, and the interest in appointing these commissioners uh, uh, or, or board members um, sooner rather than later. Um, we are going to pose this to the executive committee for a vote on the, on the list of recommendations, but we do intend to um, update the full commission uh, at our June meeting. Um, okay, so let me pause again. Uh, any questions that may have come in um, about the prior uh, legislative issues or about um, the new rail authority and the request for names? Um, Alan, are we seeing anybody come through with a hand raised? I know, Madam Chair, no hands are raised. All right. Um, I assume everyone Madam Chair, just, hi. Yeah, please, yeah, Madam Mr. Chair. Snyder, hello. Hi, sure, hi, thanks. So um, um, for a future commission meeting, I'm wondering if we could have more discussion about the governance of this new authority and the relationship with NVTC and what we think would be a most constructive approach. Um, it sounds like there could be overlaps. Unless it's done right, there could even be conflict. So. Um, can we have a little bit more discussion of that and, and uh, um, some um, even potential recommendations from us regarding how you would work the two organizations together? Thanks. Um, thanks, Mr. Senator. I think we could certainly add that to a future list. Um, given that their docket is, is pretty dissimilar from ours, um, uh, it could be helpful, and I can try to reach out to you separately too to get a sense of what you're thinking in terms of those conflicts so we can ensure that we prepare a conversation to, to hit on the points of concern. Um, but I think we could certainly add that and uh, we'll look forward to doing it maybe in um, June or July to, uh, as, it, as a group gets appointed. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Okay. All right, well, again, please do reach out to, to Kate or to me with recommended names for consideration. Um, in our home stretch, uh, uh, our penultimate presentation, um, we're glad to be joined by Mr. Dalton, um, the acting CEO of the Virginia Railway Express. Um, we don't have any VRE action items tonight. Um, there are two written reports for you to read as part of that agenda. Um, there's a COVID-19 update from Mr. Dalton, um, as well as an April CEO report. Um, uh, let me uh, turn it over to Mr. Dalton for any additional remarks. Well, good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, Commission members and others. Uh, as, as Chair Crystal mentioned, you do have uh, those couple of reports in your package, the uh, monthly update and the CEO report. Um, but first, I just want to update you on two recent very unfortunate incidences that involved uh, VRE service on April 20th, VRE train 306 struck a person in the CSX right away north of Longbridge. Uh, sadly, the person was pronounced dead at the scene. DC Metro Police uh, continue their investigation. And then on May 5th, VRE train 313 struck a person in the CSX right away, a little, a little over a mile south of the Crystal City Station. And again, sadly, the person was pronounced dead at the scene. The city of Alexandria and CSX are leading that investigation. Uh, just want to pass along our sincere condolences to all the families involved. And of course, I will update you uh, and the VRE operations board once the investigations for these two incidences are completed. Um, as shown in the monthly update, uh, ridership is down. We're approximately about 97, down by about 97% compared to the same period last year. We're currently operating at a reduced level of service. Fair revenues have fallen, and 
currently projected to remain at these levels, which are significantly lower than budgeted for fiscal year 20. I am providing regular updates to the VRE Operations Board on projected ridership, revenue, and expenses for our current fiscal year, our current update through April. Uh, we're projecting a net deficit from operations for the fiscal year of about approximately $2.2 million. And that's before we recognize the following assist assistance. We did receive uh, $1.1 million of the emergency grant funding in early April uh, through DRPT. Again, thank you, Jennifer Mitchell and your staff for expediting those funds. And then we are um, analyzing and uh, applying for approximately uh, $86.1 million of funding from the CARES Act that will be available to VRE, primarily for reimbursement of eligible operating expenses. A uh, big shout out and thank you to Kate Matice and others uh, for your tireless efforts in uh, in pushing that legislation, you know, pushing that the, the the legislation through on behalf of the region. Currently, VRE staff were working remotely uh, as part of our continuity of operations, and I'd be remiss to uh, to uh, uh, not mention that. And in some cases, I do want to recognize that. The same staff are, in some cases, doubling as math, science, literature, theater, and physical education teachers for their school-aged children. Uh, all business functions are, are fully operational. Our contracted service providers, including train operations, crews, locomotive and passenger car maintenance personnel, passenger car and station cleaners, facility maintenance teams, train dispatchers and maintenance away teams, and a host of others, are providing the frontline services necessary to continue VRE operations to ensure essential personnel can get to work. And I'm, I do want to report that uh, to date, uh, we have no recorded positive COVID-19 results for any of those, uh, any of those frontline workers. Um, we're currently enhancing uh, our current processes and protocols to ensure that we welcome back our riders. Uh, as we, in accordance with current guidance and directives, of course, to ensure that, that we maintain a safe, safe and healthy uh, environment for their commute. We continue to scenario plan and refine our FY 2021 projections for ridership revenue and expenses. And I will share this with the VRE Operations Board uh, in the coming months. Uh, and then finally, I just want to personally thank the entire VRE staff, Keolis Rail Services Virginia, the DRPT staff, PRTC staff, NVT staff, DRUMAC, Fresh Air, NVE, STV, and a host of other folks, including our, our jurisdictional staff for your continued support and teamwork. Uh, obviously, in unprecedented times like this require unprecedented responses and unprecedented uh, people, if you will, and those and those just mentioned and many others in this region have, have certainly exceeded expectations uh, to, uh, to positively contribute to uh, VRE operations at this time. So thank you, Madam Chair. That is my report. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Dalton. And I know the team has been working um, incredibly hard, uh, as is evidenced by the fact that um, the ability to report uh, zero positive cases. Uh, I know you all began with um, uh, stepped up cleaning, et cetera, way back in February, and, and we really appreciate that. Um, to take just a moment uh, uh, as well to speak in my capacity as the um, former chair of the VRE board and the, the chair of its executive search committee this year, just want to update um, NVTC commissioners um, that the, the search committee is proceeding. Um, we're about a month off schedule because of the COVID interrupted, or interruption, um, but we are aiming to still have a recommendation um, to the two parent committees, commissions rather, PRTC and NVTC, um, uh, before the summer recess or latest immediately after. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions from um, commissioners, uh, including those on the VRE operations <clears throat> board um, uh, or, or not uh, about how that process is unfolding. Um, okay, so I think um, I'm going to go ahead and turn to the executive director report and then we will end with any comments and questions from commissioners. Um, so Ms. Matice, your report, please. 
Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I do have, uh, as usual, the report is included in your materials, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. I think what I do want to spend time on uh, is really thanking um, all of the staff, uh, in particularly Melissa and Rhonda, uh, and then Zach, who's been turning our slides today, um, and Alan, who's been helping with the hand raising, and basically all of the staff who made possible doing the, um, the WebEx YouTube interface. Um, I've done a lot of webinars uh, in my past, but doing one that's also live streamed uh, and has uh, potential of as, like 28 people participating uh, in, is definitely a, an interesting challenge, but uh, the staff have been absolutely incredible. They've been troubleshooting. We tried a bunch of different platforms to see what was going to work. Um, and so really a huge thanks to all the staff. Um, some of which are, are even just watching from YouTube now to make sure that everything's going fine. Um, and so, uh, so congratulations to everybody because we're almost there. Um, and so that's, you know, pretty much what I want to report on. Um, and uh, as well as, you know, just a reminder, we've got our financial reports uh, for March 2020. We always provide financial reports uh, for revenues within our materials. It will be interesting watching those moving forward, um, as Scott was saying. Uh, but that, that is what I have. Um, I'm actually just pickled that, pickled that we're here at this point in the meeting. And so far, I think we've almost been able to get everybody to participate. But we'll definitely want to hear from uh, folks afterwards and what we can do better if we need to be doing this again in June. Um, Kate, thank you so much. The team has truly been extraordinary. Um, and so have you all, commissioners. Thank you for hanging with us. Uh, it's nearly 30 person call. Um, you all have been participating and, and hanging in and I appreciate you so much. Um, so let me uh, wrap up then on the, um, on a final opportunity for questions or comments for Kate, um, uh, Ms. Matthias, Mr. Dalton there. Uh, anything for the good of the order? Um, Mr. Fai, do we see any questions or any hands raised coming up? No hand raised or questions, Madam Chair. Okay, so that concludes all of our work. So uh, uh, without objection, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Thank you so much for participating and thank you again, a big thank you to the NBTC staff team for making this virtual meeting possible. Hope everyone stays well and safe.